Welcome to episode 14 of the Cycling Europe podcast for March 2020. Now, when you think of long-distance cyclists, you might think of Mark Beaumont, Tim Moore, Josie Dew, perhaps even me. Few people would think of listing children's TV presenter and one-time resident of the I'm a Celebrity Jungle, Timmy Mallet. He's the guest of this month's podcast and... Timmy has just published a book about his cycle from southern England to Santiago de Compostela in Spain called Utterly Brilliant. I began by asking Timmy if he'd been heading off on epic cycling adventures for a long time. Yeah, I have actually. I've been doing more of it than I suppose I realised. I've done a number of bike rides. I I started off with biking holidays uh where i joined uh you know somebody else organizing it i think we i did it with a pal across morocco uh, which was good fun and uh, another cycle ride in turkey Uh, and then i started doing some more cycling uh, in the uk and trying it out you know trying out carrying panniers and your overnight gear and staying somewhere and seeing how we got on it's intriguing, really, because it's it's quite different. The cycling is is completely different when you are aiming for somewhere different uh, and you are going to um, be a tourer. Cycling and touring, yeah, that's quite different. In a few moments, we're going to talk about your trip along the Camino de Santiago, uh, which you did back in, in 2018. But just actually, before we do that... How long have you been cycling? You said these trips to Morocco and elsewhere. Is that a long time ago? Is that recently? Oh, okay. So I did a Moroccan trip 2004. Then I did Turkey 2006. But the cycling itself, I've always cycled. Uh, You know, it's part of the way of getting around and exploring on two wheels. There's something about that. You can stop and admire what you're looking at. Family holidays would be camper vanning. We've done a number of big long trips across Australia and across Canada, and took um, bikes on the back of the camper van so that you know when you get to where you're staying, you, off you go and explore on the bikes. But the, the cycling touring, as such, began here in the UK. I remember cycling across um, uh, Hadrian's Wall with uh, with my pal. Uh, okay, how does this work? How many miles do you do a day? How do you work that out and start planning your accommodation, where you're going to stay and what you're going to do? Well, the, the cycling uh, coast to coast across Hadrian's Wall was a recognized and well-traveled route. Uh, and it's a really good one. It, it's a challenge. It's quite a challenge, especially some of those climbs can be quite strenuous. But I followed that up with cycling part of Cycle Route 4 across South Wales. Then I did I looked for other coast-to-coast routes. And there's a number of coast-to-coast routes in the UK. One of the, my favourites is coast-to-coast in the southwest from Barnstable to Plymouth. And that follows uh, the uh, Tucker Trail and then down the Drake Trail you go round Oakhampton to Tavistock, then Tavistock down to Plymouth. And that's roughly 100 miles or so. Uh, and we did that, I think, in three days. That was always good. Now, what I tend to do is to take the bike on the train somewhere and go off exploring. I'll usually take my paints with me and uh, use it as, as an opportunity to get inspiration for painting. And that's easy. So there's lots of that. But the Camino de Santiago, that was in another league altogether. In terms of your credentials as a cycle, as a long distance cycle tourer, they sound pretty top notch, actually. So what inspired you to decide to head off? Uh, It wasn't just the Camino de Santiago, was it? You actually cycled from where you live in Berkshire all the way through France and then joined the route in Spain. And then actually you cycled back as well. I, I like the fact you described me as a top-notch touring cyclist, Andrew. Thank you very much. I'll take that. Yes, I am. <laughs> so the Camino de Santiago is an ancient p- 
pilgrimage route, which has been around a thousand years. And it's it, it, back in the Middle Ages when Chaucer was writing his Canterbury Tales, roughly a quarter of a million people a year would set off from their home wherever they lived in Europe and make their way to Santiago de Compostela in northwest Spain to the cathedral where the bones of St. James the Apostle are buried. He's the brother or cousin of Christ. And I really like the idea of this setting off from home to Santiago and back again. Now, this isn't the first time I've done the Camino de Santiago. I, I was tempted with this um, back in 2012 when me and my pal Gary cycled from Leon in uh, the middle of northwest Spain, uh, and took a week's cycling to Santiago, uh, and then we had a company who would arrange the accommodation that you tell them how far you wanted to cycle each day. They arranged the accommodation and did the transfer of your bags. Oh, wow, this is all right. And they arranged for a, a rental bike and off you went. However, you know, we still got what you would expect to get on these long distance bike rides, which is punctures, chain issues, uh, all sorts of things. Uh, but it was a sense of achievement like no other. It was absolutely sensational and went back a um, uh, following year and did part of the Camino, the uh, Via de la Plata, which starts in Seville. We went at, um, uh, at Easter time thinking, you know, this is bound to be better weather. Well, uh, the rain in Spain falls mainly on the plain. It was definitely on the plain. It was a wet and soggy route. And we went as far as Quesaras over a week. And it wasn't a great success it was interesting but it wasn't quite what i what we had hoped for from the first experience and then my pal gary challenged me he said you know let's do this again properly let's do the full full distance and by that he meant cycling from saint jean pierre de port at the foot of the pyrenees along the camino frances the recognized northern route that takes you through pamplona and burgos and leon and Saria and into um, Santiago de Compostela. Uh, but what I meant by doing the full route was that traditional idea of what the original pilgrims would do, which was leave home, set off from home and make my way to Santiago. And it, it's been buzzing around in my head, I suppose, for five or six years. And one of those things that's too big a dream to discuss, you can't say it out loud because then it's going to happen, you know, and people would, you've got to have a bit more of an idea about how or why or when you're going to do this. So what role did your, your older brother play in this, uh, Martin? Well, he played actually a really pivotal role in this because it was one of those dreams that I had and I, I, I watched my big brother Martin with Down syndrome, language and learning difficulties, uh, reaching his potential each and every day. And that it occurred to me that I could cycle the Camino de Santiago inspired by Martin in that same way to reach your potential to set yourself this extraordinary target of cycling all the way to Santiago and back again, unaccompanied and uh, unplanned in the sense that I didn't want to have my accommodation pre-booked. I would take this as it came and work it out as you go, to be rooted in the moment, to make the most of the here and now of living, like my brother Martin. So Martin uh, had a particular skill with his language and learning difficulties of engaging with whoever he was with and everything he did was about now this moment most of the time we look forward to things uh, we say life will be great when it's the weekend or i get a better job or more money or whatever but by being rooted in the moment that's quite a different way of of living uh, and I watched Martin do this. And I thought, I wonder if I can do something similar on my bike. So the key to this was to take my painting equipment with me and paint the adventure. Because by doing that, you have to stop, get off the bike, 
and be involved in where you are. It's not like taking a photo because you can take happy snappies and click away as you're going or run a video if you like. No, painting it, drawing it means that you're engaged in your environment, who you're with, uh, and it makes you stop. Right. I started thinking to myself, how am I going to do this? How am I going to carry painting gear? What, what are you going to carry? So there's quite a lot of the autumn beforehand working it out. Watercolours, yep, they're easy. I actually prefer oil painting. Oil painting is too messy. It takes too long to dry. Let's try acrylics. They're quite quick drying, quite forgiving. Okay, what size can you carry? And I worked out an A3 size in, a, in an A3 box uh, in a dry bag uh, on top of the two panniers uh, at the back of your bike. That would work. Took quite a while to work that out. How do you carry an easel? I can't carry an easel, so you've got to have some way of setting the whole thing up so you put, have a box arrangement. Okay, that takes a little bit of practice. And people were saying, so what's the charity? What are you raising money for? I said, I'm not raising money. I'm raising awareness of reaching your potential, inspired by my brother Martin. I was going to say, about a week before I set off, Martin died suffering from dementia and this rather threw things into confusion if you like how do you continue a ride when you're in consumed with grief uh, and at his funeral in Aberdeen my big brother Paul found his Martin's name tags you know the things that you sew into the back of uh, your clothes so that your mum knows they're yours <laughs> when you're going to school. I took a bunch of Martin Mallet name tags and I used them to mark my journey across Europe. So when I came to somewhere special, if it's a painting or a stop of some sort, a, a, a wayside marker, a great view, a vineyard, a castle, a church or whatever, I'd leave a little Martin Mallet name tag. And there's in, in my book, I've got this beautiful pink map at the front showing the exact GPS and what three words code of every single Martin Mount name tag across Europe. And it became quite a key to the way I was marking the journey and inspirational. So you were doing two things really as you were, as you were cycling. You were marking the various points with the name tags and you were also doing the painting from time to time. How did you actually decide when to stop and do the painting? Ah, well, part of it is make sure that you do. Make sure that you notice things. Uh, and uh, again, the business of, uh, of cycling with a declared ambition of where you're aiming for each day can be a little distracting. So, for instance, my pal, Gary, who I cycled with the first couple of times when I uh, did some of these practice rides, his, his way of doing it is to get there. Uh, his idea is, let's get there. And then when I get there, I'll relax and I'll look around the town. Mine is the business of getting there. I'm more interested in the journey than I am in the destination. That journey is really key to it. So notice the weather. Uh, and that was easy to notice the weather because I set off just around, uh, the, you know, around the time of the beast from the east, and and I had torrential downpours and wild wind and and an extreme, extreme weather for the entire uh, way. Spring did arrive, but well, <laughs> well into Spain before I got um, what you might call recognisable balmy nice spring weather but the the weather means that you notice things you you are involved in your environment so uh, if you can't paint because it's lashing with rain you take a photo or a little mental picture of it or it might be a, a, over a tea break or something a little sketch of some sort and then at my accommodation that night i would work up the pictures into uh, into a painting so some of the paintings are done on location, some are done in the accommodation, and some are done back in my studio at a later stage. That, by the way, is my lovely phone pinging away. <laughs> <laughs> now, carry on. 
a lot of people who are listening to this obviously will be long distance cyclists and they will have done their own trips or they're looking for inspiration perhaps to do their own trip there is one key difference which you did on your cycle to Santiago and that was the fact that you did it on an electric bike yeah, I did an e-bike, yeah. And I'm um, absolutely thrilled I had that e-bike. What a great, great thing to get. I mean, e-bikes uh, transform your cycling. They are, without a doubt, uh, a game changer. It, it makes all the difference. So I'll give you an example. First of all, uh, I'm carrying two full panniers and my painting gear. So I'm carrying quite a bit of weight, uh, and that weight will end up being something in the region of 25 kilos. Now, a very, very heavy rucksack on your back would be about 15 kilos. So I'm carrying quite a bit of weight. And then there's me on top of it. So you, you do find that the extra bit of assistance that you get from an e-bike is very, very encouraging. So when you come to the hills, you, you'll click it in. You'll just um, choose one of the three modes, eco, normal, sport. I, I can't remember the times I used sport. I don't think I ever did. I think it would be just click it into ego, uh, eco and, um, you know, drop your gearing down and keep your cadence up and, and pedal. And you just get more to your pedaling. But the key thing I really enjoyed about the e-bike is I stop more. Now, that's a weird thing to say when you're a cyclist, stopping more. Yeah, it's not how far you go, it's not how fast. It's how much fun you have along the way. And you stop because you can. If you're on a normal bike, a, a road bike, a hybrid, or a mountain bike, whatever, you come around the corner, you see a great view, you go, oh, look at that, better take a picture. Oh, hang on. I can see the hill coming up. I've got the momentum going. Tell you what, I'll give that a miss. I'll do it again at the next one. There never, ever, ever is another one. There's nothing like each and every moment of the day. So if you see something that inspires you and makes you want to stop and look at it, stop. Because on an e-bike, getting momentum again is easy. Ah. Also, it's got a great big chunky stand stands up on its own you haven't got to look for a tree to lean it against and if you go to paint a picture where well, you've got a stable thing to rest your canvas on uh, and it makes it uh, easier oh absolutely joyous and love it it's a giant explore one um that comes in a range of sizes there's a, a large size a medium and a small medium was what i had uh, but you know you can make yourself uh, get, get yourself fitted out for it nice chunky tires hey the other thing andrew is um i didn't i got one puncture in, in two and a half thousand miles one puncture you go out today you get a puncture everybody gets a puncture on a bike it happens all the time not this bike this is a wonderful thing i did get a broken chain yeah i got that that was within a mile from home so what happened there how did that happen don't know I, th mm. I think I think the point you make about the the stopping, I think that's a a brilliant observation. I, I I've always said that for me, one of the attractions of 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 the cycling is the fact you can just easily pull on your brakes. You can't do that in a car. You can't do no. that on a train. You can't do that on a bus. But on a bike, you no. you see something and you think, yeah. God, I, I just need to stare at that for ten minutes. You yeah. just stop you immediately. Do. You don't have to consult with anybody. You just do it and you and you enjoy whatever you're looking at. In terms of the practicalities of the e-bike, things like charging it, was that an issue at all? Every night, charge it every night. You've got to carry the charger. That's quite a hefty thing. You know, it weighs, what, four, four, four or five kilos, maybe. I mean, it's quite, yeah, it's quite a weighty thing. Would it be that much? Maybe not that much, but it, it's a bulky, it's a bulky bit of kit that you've got to carry. And were you staying so, in hotels or camping or? Uh, I, I was in B&Bs and hostels, occasional uh, hotel, but I, I never had a difficulty finding somewhere to charge it. Every night I would charge it. And, and to charge it, it would take five, five or five, six hours. I mean, it's, it's quite a, 
quite a long time to charge it from from zero to to full. But then you look at how much you're going to get out of it, and uh, I would get a hundred kilometres from a from a charge, a hundred kilometres, and I'm carrying uh, my weight and the the panniers the other weight. So all told, there's the bike plus a hundred kilos. So it, it's carrying quite a bit. It's a big hefty piece of kit. It still does a hundred kilometres. Oh my goodness, that's all right. And of course, you can if you think to yourself, oh, well, "I'm going to need a bit of extra charge today." You can charge it at lunchtime. The other thing I really liked about it, it's got a little uh, adapter on there, so you can plug in your phone uh, or your uh, your device, whatever it is, and you could power it from from the bike. It's got lights that come on uh, automatically, LEDs, so you've got bright lights. You are noticeable, and that's really important when you're on a bike. The the the, the more substantial it is, and the brighter you are, the more chance you have of uh, traffic taking notice of you and being aware that uh, there's somebody else on the road. We're a bit snobbish about it uh, in the UK. Uh, uh, The number of people who say, well, that's not real cycling, and they're missing the point. Uh, A bike gets you out there, and uh, any way of cycling is good but uh, my belief is quite firmly that uh, e-bikes are the way to go they are game changers uh, and that um, it's far better that somebody is riding um, than not so uh, i'm a big believer in them and i think they are wonderful for those reasons i've outlined in terms of particular highlights uh, along the the route that you took and just for people so that people do know how you how you traveled you went to uh, Norm, sorry, Brittany to begin with, cycled through oh, Normandy. I'll give you the route, Andrew. So, um, first of all, I settled, set off from home in Berkshire and I cycled down to Portsmouth. Now, that's 100 miles or so and did that in two days. That was quite a, a push to do that in the first two days. And the reason for that is I was catching the Brittany ferries from Portsmouth to St. Marlo. Uh, and at that time of year in March, they, they are only certain days of the week that will go. And that was an overnight journey. And then I, I had a, a fairly straightforward route to Mont Saint-Michel. And that's the only place I pre-booked. I pre-booked Mont Saint-Michel because I wanted to stay in a World Heritage location. What I didn't realize is the, the uh, Pilgrim Hostel is at the top of the stairs, that steps by the monastery so that is 40 or 50 great big hefty steep stairs to carry the bike and all your gear up oh my goodness me one street in the middle of Mont Saint Michel but you're staying in the end you know in amongst the 11th century walls of this world heritage site it, it's uh, uh, unforgettable absolutely magnificent now w- you've got to plan your route but you don't plan your route because each and every day you're full of some sort of trepidation. Which way am I going to turn? You know, if the first decision is at the end of my drive. Do I go left or right? Ever after, which way am I going to go at the crossroads? What am I going to eat? Where am I going to stay tonight? Who am I going to meet? And to make it marginally easier, I would pre-plan a particular a route on Kamut. You know the cycling app Kamut? Yeah, yeah. That was worthwhile having that. And I programmed that into my Wahoo GPS. You know, that's just a, a variation. Or, or there's, there's a bunch of these different ones. Well, Wahoo was the one that I used. And I'm very happy with it. I like this. And that gives you a dotted line to follow. And it, it would give you either a route on the tarmac or off-road or a mixture of both. And it doesn't matter how far along here you go, but you're vaguely aiming for somewhere. And I've found out that after a while, uh, roughly 65 to 75 kilometers a day is what I would manage to do with some painting. There were occasions when I would do more, a couple of occasions when I did 100 kilometers, but that would be quite exhausting. And I didn't really want to do as much as that. Uh, Less is more. And then sometimes I do as little as 40 k's or 45 k's a day. And that's a nice, easy half day, if you like. And let's see where I get to and what I get involved with during the course of the day. 
Does so, that make sense? Yeah, absolutely. So you, you, you headed south through through France, keeping kind of to the westish side of France. And then you I'm cross following the... traditional um, Camino routes here. In, in France, they call it the Chemin de Saint-Jacques, the Way of St. James. Uh, so there are a number of routes uh, that lead from Brittany, Normandy, or Paris, or, or, or from the far east of the country, down south. They all converge pretty much on saint jean pierre de port at the Pyrenees. I, I say all of them, not quite all of them, but they are recognised routes, and a lot of them are signed. So I chose the way of the Plantagenets, which follows mainly old railway lines through Normandy and Anjou down to the Loire Valley, then across the Charente, which is big prairie country, to Poitiers. And it, this was a, a special reason because I'm a, I am love my history and I wanted to see where uh, Eleanor of Aquitaine and Richard the Lionheart had come from. I made detours to go and see their burial places uh, and to follow their historical roots and to follow about Henry II and, uh, and his fight with Thomas a Becket. I mean, these things are, are real stories. They're real people. And I, I found that 800 years later, I, I was really interested in them. I stopped off for a, um, a couple of days with my twin town just next door to Poitiers. Um, the mayor, who I stayed with, kindly shipped back the first 16 of my paintings. Then at the next place I got to, which is Sant, it's an old Roman town. I had uh, a, a kind visit from Lorraine Kelly and her husband, who were driving to Spain, and they brought with the, with them some gifts from my family for Easter, and took some more paintings away. Gave me some more boards. Headed down through Bordeaux, which I needed to stay at because I had a bike issue. Had to get to a a giant cycle shop to get things fixed. Um, and then on to the Pyrenees and the Pyrenees across that route that I've outlined before, Pamplona, Borgos, the Meseta, the big plains of northern Spain, to Leon, the big capital city, and into Santiago uh, via the old Roman route. Did you, did you meet many people in France and Spain who recognised you? Who, I think if you, presumably if you do cycling in the UK... A lot of people will recognise you because of who you are. Did you find that happened in Spain and, and, and France at all? Uh, yep. <laughs> to be honest, Andrew, it happens wherever I go. Uh, and that's fine. Uh, and if people uh, recognise me and say, oh, hello, Timmy, that's that's joyous. Uh, and if they have no idea, I'm, then I'm just a cyclist who happened to be dressed rather strangely wearing a tie and uh, brightly coloured clothes and laden with painting gear on the back of a bike. I certainly looked aside. Did you consider taking your mallet? <laughs> I didn't need that on this occasion. Very nice idea, but this had a different purpose, this bike ride. So if you, if you were to pick out a highlight, uh, just perhaps one place or one event that happened which kind of encapsulated what you were trying to achieve by the the cycle. Can you tell us about that? I think the, the thing that I found really revealing was that the business of being a pilgrim on an on a adventure like this is about being vulnerable. And it's quite an odd sensation to be in. Most of the time we like to plan stuff. <clears throat> if you're cycling with somebody else, you certainly do have to take into account somebody else's wants, needs. Where are we going to stop for something to eat? Uh, I've had enough now. I want to have somewhere to stay. When you're on your own, you wait to see what's going to happen. A good example of that would be um, cycling in the south of southwest of France and coming around the corner and seeing bright blue shutters and an, uh, with purple wisteria dripping around it, thinking, wow, that's an image, that's a painting. Uh, and I stopped, because I could, I was on the e-bike, uh, to take a 10-second photo. And then voices behind me said, bonjour, blah, 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 blah. And I said, oh, I'm admiring your beautiful shutters and wisteria. And they 
spoke good English and had lived in Oxford for some years and consequently had a love of English gardens and said, come and see our garden and have a cup of tea. I ended up painting a picture of them in their garden. And uh, when it was time to move on about six o'clock, they said, OK, you stay and have a bite to eat and there's a room for the night. And you go, now, that wouldn't have happened if I'd had my accommodation pre-planned or if I'd been with somebody else. Uh, but because I'm on an adventure of experience of moments, I'm prepared to see what's going to develop. And it was just joyous. And I find myself thinking, how lucky am I to have had that experience? So that's what I would do if I'm going to do another one of these adventures. I would do it in a similar sort of way, probably on my own. There's different routes different sorts of cycling adventures if you're with somebody else it's it's different uh, it's still entertaining and joyful but I tend to paint less because uh, I'm then I've got to somebody's got to wait while I do that so if I'm wanting to paint and be part of the moment then that's better done on my own yeah I've been looking at some of your pictures on on your painting website and I particularly like the one of the windmill where was that painted yeah now that big windswept sky with the bike uh, small in a monumental landscape it was early into my trip on the bay of St. St. Michael not far from St. Michael's Mount Mont Saint Michel and I saw the the windmill and the big sky billowing across Normandy coming over the channel. And that stopped me in my tracks. I looked at that and thought, this is this is a an analogy, if you like, of the whole uh, journey. Big landscape, small cyclist, big aim, break it down into little bits. Remember the journey between here and the cup of tea stop, here and the next town, or between here and the next bend. And because of that, Andrew, I can remember every bend in the road. Every single bit of this adventure is etched in my mind. I have a, a, a very clear memory of each and every day and what it led to. Are you planning another trip in the future? And if so, where are you going to go? What are you going to do? Uh, Andrew, there's a bunch of rides I've got in mind. Some quite big ones. I'm not going to announce them just yet because probably I, I, I'll better run them past my family first so they get used to the fact that Mallet's going off on another adventure again. I remember setting off on this one uh, with strict instructions from the family, you know, don't do anything foolish, stay off the main roads and be aware of your surroundings because they always worry that I'm too busy thinking of something else or looking at a painting image to uh, be aware of my surroundings. So before I announce any big journeys, I'll wait until I've discussed it with them. But there are a number of smaller trips I'm going to do this year. Early April, I shall cycle the south coast. I, I want to do Hastings, Rye, Romney Marsh, Folkestone, Dover, Ramsgate, around that Isle of Thanet to Margate, Whitstable and the Oysters. And I should do that with a, with a, a, a pal who wants to cycle with me and we'll do that over three days, a couple of nights. Then I'm going to do a, a cycling adventure up in the lowlands of Scotland. I've got a a literary festival I should be talking at about my book. That's a good opportunity to take the bike on the train and go and do a couple of days of uh, cycling in the lowlands of Scotland from Dumfries up to Ayr. That would be uh, great. Yeah. And in October, I'm going to go and join my five-a-siders on tour. My five-a-side footballing pals go on tour every year. And in October... The tour is to Warburg in northern Germany. And I said, I'm going to cycle there. <laughs> and then I looked at the map and I realized that just the European part 
is the equivalent of London to Lancaster. And uh, I've got to get from my home to Harwich. So that's another good couple of days to get the ferry. And so I've probably got a good couple of weeks or more. And I should think seven, 800 miles to cycle to go and play football for the weekend. Well, I think there's a beer festival involved in it as well. So that will be worthwhile going. Well, I, I went to Germany middle of last year on my bike. And I was amazed just how many people in Germany are using e-bikes uh, and you may even find when you get there that there are places actually on the street where you can actually charge them so certainly on the on the cycle routes that you might be taking so you know you, I think you might be in for a pleasant surprise when you head for, for Germany but just just one last thing we haven't really mentioned the book the book is called Utterly Brilliant I haven't actually read it but am I right in thinking it kind of talks about your career but also the cycle right to Santiago? talks about a number of different uh, elements. It starts with the Camino de Santiago, the big pilgrimage route. But along the way, I dip into stories from my career, memoirs, if you like, of Wackaday, of Timmy on the Tranny, of uh, Bitsy Bitsy, uh, of um, bike rides I've done, adventures I've had. Uh, and where all this fits into my love of being in the moment and how my brother Martin has been a big influence, more than I realised. It's it's funny to think that, but it's um, I'd, I'd be interested to hear your comments when you've uh, when you've seen it. It's got my paintings that I produced along the way in that, and there are more at malletspalette.co.uk. I've got some limited edition prints from the adventure, which are available to uh, to buy. And if you go to timmymallet.co.uk, you can get your copy personally dedicated and signed so there you go that's um, a little bit of inspiration for you life is full of um, uh, opportunities there's a great line in a john lennon song life is what happens while you're busy making plans yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. i really like that i like the fact that once you're out there on your two wheels um and you see a detour my advice is always take it or always take that thing that could be intriguing because you never know if you'll ever pass this way again. And you might as well see it and, uh, and explore it. And if on your next cycle ride you find yourself on the Camino de Santiago and having looked at the map in the front of my book, you come across a Martin Mallet name tag, send me a photo of it, but leave it where it is. Yeah. Have you had many people contacting you saying they found these things? The book's been out a month now, so I'm expecting there will be some comments during the course of the summer. Uh, there's certainly been a lot, lots of interest in people saying, I'm looking out for them. I'd like to be involved in this. Uh, it, it's just about marking the journey. We're all on a bit of a, an adventure. And the important thing is make sure you enjoy it all as you go. Yeah. Well, I grew up in the early 80s watching you on the TV and it's delightful to have spoken to you now about something that has become really important in your life, which is obviously the cycling. And I, yeah. think, I think a lot of people listening to what you've just been saying, well, first of all, they'll agree wholeheartedly with, with more or less everything that you said about cycling. But I think also a lot of them will be inspired to head off and perhaps do something similar themselves. Well, I, you know, it's a two and a half month, two month adventure. And along the way there and back again, I cycled 2,500 miles. It's the equivalent of Land's End to John O'Groats, back to Land's End, turn around and go up to Scotland again. That gives you a little idea of how far I pedal. And yet you don't think of it in those big terms. You think of it only in the moment. The here and now, where am I going to end up? What's around this corner? Where am I heading to? What's in this town that's, that gives me a reason to stop and have a look at? And what's the food like here? What's the accommodation like? How much fun am I going to have? That's brilliant. Thank you. And good luck on your future journeys and good luck with the book. Thanks ever so much, Andrew. Good luck with your podcast and it's a pleasure to be joining you on it today.